So today we're going to be continuing in our series um, in the book of Revelation. We've been going through this series called Stranger Things. And we've literally just been walking through verse by verse um, what God is saying to us through his word. Amen. And so today we're just going to pick it up right where we left off last time. We'll be looking at the church in Philadelphia today. So I'm going to read Revelation chapter 3. And I'm going to start at verse 7 and just read through 13. Amen. And it reads, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these are the words of him who is holy and true. He who holds the key of David, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Jesus says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. Everybody say little strength. Yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I'm going to make them come and fall down at your feet and they will acknowledge that I loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth Jesus says I'm coming soon so hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown the one who is victorious I will make a pillar in the temple of my God never again will they leave it I will write on them a new, I'll write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them, somebody say, my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, this is your word, so help me to teach it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I don't have a title today, so don't, you know, hope you're not looking for one. <laughs> Don't have a title today, but according to a recent survey in 2022, research shows us that Americans are more exhausted than ever before. And this almost seems like a universal reality. We hear it in our life groups. You know, people are just tired. We talk about being tired all the time. Parents are feeling tired. They're feeling weak. They're lacking strength. Single mothers feeling exhausted. Those of you who are working multiple jobs out here in L.A. just to make ends meet, you're, you've been tired. You've been feeling overwhelmed. Those of you who are trying to advance in your career, but you just keep meeting roadblock after roadblock, you are, too, you're experiencing tiredness. You know what I mean? Just feeling weary and frustrated. And there are some of us who've been battling, you know, relational conflicts with people. You know, with people that we love, children, whether it be parents, significant others, spouse. Um, sometimes those conflicts just zap the life right out of you and just leave you drained and tired. And can I be real? There's, you know, some people who even came to church today who are experiencing disappointment from God. You know, you haven't, you know, uh, I remember Bishop told me this a long time ago. You have you don't know what it's like to follow God closely until you know what it's like to be disappointed by him. But some of us, we've been praying and fasting about some stuff. We've been studying the word of God nonstop. And it just seems that God just keeps putting our plans on the back burner. And because of these unanswered prayers, it's just leaving us feeling drained and exhausted. Some of you are tired because, you know, you moved all the way to L.A. to do one thing. And it's not quite working out at your pace and in your timeline. And it's just causing you to go to bed daily and wake up daily tired and frustrated. Is that anybody's story? You don't have to say amen. I know. All right. So if any of these describe your life, Jesus has words for you today. And what we see in our text, Jesus has great news for those who have little strength. He has great news for those who have little strength. In verse 7, he says, these are the words of him who is holy, true, and holds the keys of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. And what I love about this is that if you look at verse 8, again, it says he's talking to a church who has little strength. And so to encourage this church who has little strength, he reminds them of who they are in relationship with. That's what he uses to encourage them. He reminds them of who they are in relationship with. And I know this is too cliche for some of us, 
But if you find yourself in a place of doubt, if you find your place in a, a, a season of tiredness and worry, the best thing you can do is fix your eyes on Jesus and also remind yourself who it is you're actually in relationship with. And here he says, I know you've got little strength, but here's, here's three things I want to give you. I'm the holy one, I am the true one, and I am the one who holds the key of David. When Jesus says he is holy, that simply means that there is no other God like him. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. There's no other God like him. It means that there's no other God beside him. It means that he truly sits on the counsel of his own will. It means that all other idols will have to come and bow down to this God. That's what that means. He's holy. Next, he says, these are the words of the one who is true. Everybody say true. And just to make sure we all on the same page about this, Jesus is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the and the life. So what does that mean? That means truth has already been defined. But for some reason, with each generation, we think our feelings about something should redefine truth. It's real quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Whitney. But the thing about feelings, if we really pause and think about our own feelings and our own lives, our feelings have led us all to make some bad decisions. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Meaning, feelings can't always be trusted. In fact, there are some painful seasons we could have avoided had we not listened to our feelings. Yet, for some reason, we have ascribed to this notion that our feelings should trump and redefine truth. But if truth is based on your feelings, and if truth is based on my feelings, and if truth is based on their feelings, then what is actually the standard of truth? The standard of truth is Jesus. It's Jesus. And here in our text, Jesus is reminding us today in a world that is constantly confused about who and what truth is he says these are the words of the one who is true amen next he says i have the key of david and to understand what this means we've got to go back to the old testament and i do have this verse as well that we're going to put up on the screen isaiah chapter 22 um, and just to kind of tell you what's happening in isaiah 22 there's this guy by the name of king hezekiah and he has a guy in place by the name of Shebna who was the palace administrator, right? So that means he was in charge of who came in to the palace and who went out of the palace. It was more like a security type of position. And so, but this guy named Shebna, he was caught in a scam and God removed him from position. And then God comes on the scene and he raises up his replacement because God always raises up replacements. Amen. Amen. God comes, he raises up his replacement for King Hezekiah, and his name was Eliakim. And God says this about Eliakim in Isaiah 22, 22. He says, I'm going to place on his shoulders the key to the house of David. And what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. So here in our text, what Jesus is saying, what was true about Eliakim is even more so the truth about Jesus. It speaks of his messianic authority, his control, and his sovereignty. And because Jesus has the key of David, this is what this means for us. It means that we have access to the presence of God. That's the first thing it means. It means we have access to the presence of God. Now, I know we're so used to taking the presence of God for granted, but it's only because of Jesus that we can boldly approach God's throne with, of grace and confidence. It's the only reason. He's the only reason. The Bible says in his presence, there is liberty. In his presence, there's the fullness of joy. But we only have access to his presence that we take for granted because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And because of his sacrifice, he has the key to the house of David. Next, because Jesus has the key of David, number two, that means whatever God has determined, it cannot be defeated. Whatever God has determined cannot be defeated. Jesus is saying, whatever door that I open for you, it can't be shut. Whatever door God opens, your enemies can't shut. Whatever door God opens, you can't even shut. What God has for you, it is for you. And there's truly no devil in hell that can do anything about that. None. 
Jesus is saying, for those who are faithful, even those of you who have little strength, even though you may not be the most qualified, because you resisted evil and held on to me, I'm going to set before you an open door. Open doors represent opportunities. It represents access. But one thing you and I, we must understand is that every opportunity that is set before you is not always a God opportunity. Amen. Amen. Every door is not a God door. Just because it pays more does not automatically mean that that was God's door for your life. I've seen many people who accepted more money and found out later that more money wasn't worth the toxicity, the stress, and the depression that came with the pay raise. I've seen it time and time again. And for some of us, the reason why we aren't available to walk through the doors God has set before us is because we keep walking through trap doors that the enemy keeps setting before us. And so what I'm trying to say, don't miss out on God opportunities because you were too preoccupied and settling for good opportunities. Amen. Number three, when Jesus says he has the keys, y'all probably not going to like this one. But that means that Jesus is the only one who decides who gets to come in and who is out. You see, now many of us unrighteously love to judge people as if we got the keys, as if our name was saying we got the keys to the house of David. That's not what the Bible says. It says Jesus has the keys. And so because Jesus has the keys, that means you and I, we don't get to determine who comes in and who goes out. And because we're in this, you know, 21st century trying to understand this text that was written to a persecuted group of believers at the end of the first century, we don't understand the depth of good news that that verse alone portrayed to its original audience. This is good news because the first century followers of Jesus, they did not have access into the Roman palace. They had no social standing in Rome. Right. They were at the bottom of the social totem pole and they were forgotten and constantly looked over. And so Jesus, in that context, he comes on the scene and he says, my dear saints in Philadelphia, I know you may not have access to the powers in Rome and you may not have access to their riches and to their jobs and to their status. But you have something that Rome cannot give you. You have access to my kingdom. He's saying you have access, direct access to my presence. And I just want to encourage some of you in here today and remind you that you may not have access to the shakers and movers in the industry. You may not have access to people who are extremely influential and powerful right now. You may not have access to people of notoriety and popularity, but better than all of that stuff, you have access to the presence of God. Thank you, Jesus. And the reason why just a few people clapped, this is the next point I'm going to make, because one of the most saddest realities of our Christianity today is that we are living this walk of faith without knowing the kind of access that we truly have. That's why we, that's why we just patty caked with it. Because we don't know the access that we truly have. We go through our whole lives missing out on the things God has for us. Because we don't know. We're not aware of the access we have in his presence. In Christ Jesus, he is the source to many resources. In Christ Jesus, he's the source of healing. He's the source of our deliverance and of our, our power. Amen? In Jesus, we have access to provision. I know you think it's your job because they cut the check, but I'm telling you, Jesus is the one who provides for you. He's the one who provides for you. In Jesus, salvation is available. We have to remind ourselves of who we're in relationship with and what this relationship gives us access to. Amen? Jesus, he is the holy and true one. He's the one who holds the key of David. And after he introduces himself, he lets this church know that he sees them. He sees them. And remember in chapter one, he told us that, that Jesus, he walks among his churches. So there isn't a thing that goes on, especially in his church, that he does not see. Amen. And he says to them in verse eight, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And I love this because Jesus says you got little strength, 
What does this mean? Jesus is attracted to those who have little strength. Jesus can't help but draw towards people who have little strength. Jesus said to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And I believe we need to hear and really take heed to these words from Jesus today because many of us burden ourselves trying to be strong all the time. Many of us are so used to being the rock in our families and the rock for our friends all the time. Some of you came to church today, and although you are tired, although you have little strength, you've sat through this whole worship set today, and not once in this gathering have you gave yourself the freedom to be weak. The freedom to confess that you don't have it all together. The freedom to confess that, God, I need some help today. Some of you, you live with the burden of having to hold it all together all the time. Some of you, you came from families that are so dysfunctional that if you didn't hold it together, it would all just fall apart. And so, but now the dysfunction has trained you to never show any signs of weakness. And now you live your life 20 years later past the point of moving out of your parents' house and are still suppressing your weakness all in the name of trying to look strong. And that mindset of hiding your weakness weakness, It may work in corporate America. You know what I mean? It may work as you're trying to grow in your career. It may work out in the world, but that was never how God intended it to work in the body of Christ. You must be willing to confess your weakness. You must be willing to say, God, I don't have all these words to say in this prayer. I'm just tired. Because it's when you truly come to the end of yourself that you will experience the fullness of strength that is only offered and available in Christ. It's at the end of yourself that you will experience the power of God in a fresh new way. God doesn't need you to be strong. He doesn't need you to hold it all together. He just needs you to be honest. He just needs you to be honest. Jesus says you've got little strength. You're experiencing pain after pain. You've been going through it. But here's what I commend you on. In the midst of all of that, you have endured, meaning you have held on to my word and you have not denied my name. And here's the thing. We often want a round of applause because we held on for a period of time. Amen. We, we, want, we want people to stand up for us, give us a standing ovation because we held on for a little bit. But the blessing comes to those who persevered till the end. First John 2.19 says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. My mama used to tell me, son, the kingdom don't need any more fair-weathered Christians. The kingdom don't need any more Christians who only follow God because they think they can finesse a blessing out of him. But but don't love him enough to stand the test of time. The kingdom has need for Christians who know what it's like to hold on. Who knows what it's like to endure and persevere for the faith. Many of us, we're only faithful in between circumstances. We're only faithful in between seasons of persecution. We're only faithful in between seasons of hurt and disappointment. And if you want Jesus to say to you, well done, thy good and faithful servant, it's not going to be because you held on to his word and refused to deny him when everything was going good. It's going to be because you stayed with him even when choosing him was not convenient. It's going to be because you held on to him even when friends and family didn't understand your level of commitment to him. It's going to be because you stuck it out for Jesus even when everybody else turned their back on you when you made that decision. Jesus commended them because they held on to his word. They held on to the teachings of the apostles. They held on to the good news of the gospel and they did not deny his name. And there's something inspiring about seeing people with little strength refusing to let go of Jesus. 
There's something inspiring about seeing people who are facing a bad diagnosis, dealing with trials and tribulations, people who are at the end of their rope, very few options on the table, refusing to let go of Jesus. Verse 9 says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I'm going to make, make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. There were some Jews in Philadelphia at this time who were simply making life hard for the Christians in Philadelphia. And you may understand, you, I mean, you must understand during this time, Jews, they held great political power, right? They were seated in positions of authority, and there was a fracture in Judaism because now some of the Jews actually believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And because of that, there was this split. Now you have this group who are still waiting on the Messiah to come because they don't believe he was Jesus. And then you have this other group who turned to Jesus because they believed he was truly the Messiah. And so early on, there was this tension between these two groups. And there were some Jews in Philadelphia who were making it their personal business to make life hard for the Christians in Philadelphia. And that's why Jesus refers to this particular group, the Jews who were enforcing the persecution as the synagogue of Satan. Because they were the ones inflicting persecution on those who chose Jesus. And Jesus sees the suffering of the saints of Philadelphia, and he says, this is not the time for you to get mad and retaliate. This is not the time for you to hoard anger in your heart. This isn't the time to become bitter and start lashing out. He says, I know you have been going through it, and it seems like they have their foot on your neck. But if you remain faithful, there is going to come a day when God is going to turn the table. He's going to turn the table. And that which was over your head will now be under your feet. Yeah. Don't you know, we serve a kind of God who don't just flip tables in the temple when he gets upset, but he's also the God who turns tables in our lives every single day. Yeah. When you remain faithful at any given moment, you qualify for what I like to call a righteous remix. For the Bible shows us that God is a God of the underdog. He is the God of the oppressed. He is the God of the voices. And he says things like the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He says things like you're going to be above and not beneath. He says things like you're going to be the head and not the tail. You've heard that before. That means if I'm living for Jesus, it don't matter what circumstance I may be in right now. All I have to do is wait for the right time and Jesus is going to stand up and yell switch and the tables are going to be turned. And where we was positioned at the bottom, when he flips that thing, we're going to be at the top. That's why you're not going to catch me snapping in and out of character, trying to get even with people. No, no, no. That's why in this season, you aren't going to find me trying to fight my own battles. Think what you want to think. Say what you want to say. Because I am connected to Jesus. There is going to come a time when the tables are going to be turned. Thank you, Jesus. Next, Jesus says, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I loved you. And what Jesus wants us to see here is that if you build your identity around excluding and persecuting others, don't be surprised that you are farther from God than the ones you spent your life persecuting. You see, some of these Jews thought they were doing the will of God by persecuting the Christians. Just like the Apostle Paul before his conversion, he was literally persecuting and endorsing the murder of Christians. And he thought truly he was doing the will of God. And Jesus turned to those who have been persecuted and forgotten. And he says, there's going to come a day when the whole world is going to know how much I love you. There's going to come a day where God is going to vindicate the downtrodden in the very presence of their oppressor. And now this is encouraging, but it also serves as a warning that if you build an identity on who and what you are against, don't be surprised if you find yourself working against God. There are Christians today who build their whole identity on the political parties they are against. 
There are Christians who build their entire identity upon faiths that they are against, upon sexual orientations that they are against. And Jesus is saying, be very careful because one day you're going to be very surprised that the people you spent your life despising in your heart, the people you spent your life hating and persecuting are the very ones I loved as well. And Jesus, he closes out the letter in verse one and he says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. And this is probably one of the most frustrating promises in the Bible because soon is subjective. Soon could be a different length of time for everybody in this room today. Our soon and God's soon, it's on two different spectrums of time. In 2 Peter 3, 8, Peter says, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. So God's timing is different. If you ask God for something, he says, okay, I'll give it to you in a day. We in trouble. We won't be here when he gives it. Amen. But so when Jesus says, I'm coming back soon, it was never his intention for us to spend our days trying to calculate and compute all the numbers in the book of Revelation to figure out which date he's going to come back. That's not why he said, I'm coming soon. But he tells us that he's coming soon to the persecuted Christians so that they can keep hope. So that they can keep faith alive while they are enduring what they're going through. So we celebrate the fact that Jesus came, his virgin birth, amen? And we anticipate the day that he's coming back. But I want you to understand is that the God who has come in the past and the God who will come in the future, he is also the God who comes right now. Jesus told his disciples, he said, listen, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And when I get there, I'm going to send you an advocate from the Father who is the Holy Ghost, who is going to be with you now and forever. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is the inheritance of the new covenant. It's the inheritance. Jesus says it is the Holy Ghost who's going to teach you all things and remind you of everything that I've said to you. In other words, because we have been given this precious gift of the Holy Ghost, that means at any waking moment in my life, Jesus could come into my circumstance. That means at any given moment, Jesus can provide. At any given moment, he can heal my body. At any given moment, he can restore. That is why we prioritize the gathering of the saints so we can be reminded in spite of everything that we go through that the God who came and the God who will come is also the God who comes. Thank you, Jesus. Next he says, and I'm almost done here, verse 11, he says, hold on to what you have. Hold on to what you have, not what your neighbor has, but hold on to what you have. But then what he says is it had me thinking, this body of believers are weak. They are small in number. What could they possibly have that was worth holding on to? And the answer is Jesus and the body of Christ. Jesus and the body of Christ. Jesus is saying, if you are weak, The only thing you can hold on to is Jesus and the body of Christ that I have grafted you into. And this is why we sing praises together. This is why we worship together. This is why we open up scriptures together, because we're holding on. We're holding on. If you're tired and feeling weak, don't abandon and forsake the the community of believers that God has blessed you with to strengthen you. You know, I worship at home, I pray at home, I praise at home, but there is absolutely nothing like worshiping with the saints in person. I'm sorry if you're watching online, but there's nothing like it. There's there's literally no substitute. There's no substitute of gathering in person and worshiping God together. I don't know about you, but there's been Sundays when I've come to church and I'm just exhausted. Amen, somebody? There's been Sundays I come and I'm just exhausted. I'm just tired. There are times when I'm literally so drained from just the stuff I'm doing before church, right? And there are times when they are up here leading us in worship and I'm standing because I think the least we should do is stand, amen? Whether you're tired or not, I think that's the least we should do is stand. So I'm standing, but there are times when I don't even have the strength to lift my hands. 
There's, there's times I don't have the strength to lift up my voice and sing. There, there's times I don't have the strength to dance with Aaron. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't have the strength to dance with Carlisa. But it's something about being around people who will lift their hands even when you can't lift yours. There's something around, about being around people who will sing even when you can't lift your voice. It's something about being around people who will dance even when you can't pick up your feet and dance. And I'm a living witness that there are times you are sustained solely by the praises of the people you gathered with. I'm a living witness. That's why even when I'm tired, I don't skip the gathering. That's why. Because when I've had a long week and when I'm tired, I can't afford to skip out on the gathering of the saints because I need the strength that shows up in the room. Sometimes the strength I need is from the hug by the person at the door. Sometimes the strength I need is from holding the hand of the person sitting next to me praying during altar call. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes what I need is for someone to come and put their hand on my shoulder and just remind me that everything is going to be okay. Sometimes the strength I need, it comes from the preached word of God. He says, this is what I need you to hold on to if you need strength. Thank you, Jesus. Next, he says, if you hold on, verse 12, I'm going to do these three things for you. Number one, I'm going to make you a pillar. Number two, I'm going to give you a new city. And number three, I'm going to give you a new name. For he says, I'm going to make you a pillar in God's house. He says, I know you are small and I know you've got little strength. But for those of you who came to church today feeling like a pebble, if you hold on, I'm going to make you into a pillar. Now, in antiquity, this was important because when someone faithful died, when, when someone who had significant impact in the city, when they died, they would erect a pillar in a substantial building with that person's name inscribed on it. And that pillar served as a witness to the others of the strength and support of that person that, that was serving in that city. And what Jesus is saying to this church in Philadelphia, and he's saying to us here at RCLA as well, I know the people in this city think you're too small to have a meaningful impact in the city. They think you are too weak to be used by God. But because of your unwavering faith, I know you may not have much down here, but there is coming a day when I'm going to erect a pillar up in glory in your honor. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you a witness even beyond your life here on earth. And people, when they see your pillar... It's going to testify of your enduring faith. Thank you, Jesus. And notice he says, I'm going to give you a pillar and never again will they leave it. That part, never again will they leave it. It's important. Uh, it was significant because those in Philadelphia at this time was located right next to a volcano. And so the people of this city, they spent a great deal of their time constantly evacuating due to this erupting volcano. These people lived in a perpetual state of instability. Have you ever been there in your life before? Where things have gotten so bad that you're just waiting for the next bad thing to happen. You're just expecting the next bad report to come. The next text message, the next phone call. Where you just live in this constant state of expecting things to get worse because of how unstable you are today. Jesus is saying, in the midst of all the instability around you, I'm going to make you into a pillar of stability. I'm going to make you into a beacon of stability in the midst of instability. Real quick, just tell somebody, he's settling me. In the midst of everything I got going on in my life, everything that's happening around me, he's settling you. Next, he says, I'm going to give you a new city. He's saying, you're not going to have to worry about all these volcanoes because I've got a new city for you that you're not going to have to leave it. You don't have to worry about the instability in this city. I've got a new city for you. 
You aren't going to have to stress about this water bill and this electric bill and this rent. You ain't going to have to stress about none of that because I've got a new city for you. You're not going to have to stress about these potholes because I've got a place up in glory that the streets are paved with gold. He says, I've got a new city for you. And Jesus is saying the problems that you face right now, the the problems you face in Philadelphia, you're not going to have to face in this new Jerusalem. Last thing Jesus says, and I'm going to try to do this very calm. He says, I'm going to give you a new name. He says, I'm going to give you my name. Thank you, Jesus. During this time when the king came into power, the first thing they would do is print up money. They would put up buildings and temples and put their name on them, right? They would put their name. Putting their name on them, it would symbolize ownership. In other words, what Jesus is saying, that if you stay faithful, the greatest thing that I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you my name. I'm going to give you my name. You see, your name, it has some significance. It does. I'm not dismissing that. Your name, it has some significance. Your name has access in your spheres of influence. You may have access to certain things at your job because of your name. But what I love about Jesus is that he gives us a name that's better than our own name. The text says that he is going to give us his name. As wonderful as your family name may be, I hate to break it to you, but your name won't work up in glory. Your name won't get you through them pearly gates. Or imagine just going up to them gates, talking about my name is Nick Castle, open up, let me in. Your name is not going to get you there. But if you got the right name, if you got the name that is still above every name, you have access to the new city. In other words, we really are all cousins. We got the same name, amen? Look at somebody real quick, say, what up, cuz? No, you ain't got to do that. You ain't got to do that. <laughs> We're going to have the same name when we get there. And the reason why we ought to give God praise is because the name of Jesus don't just give you access when you get to the gates. But his name gives you access even right now. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but although I love my name, demons don't tremble at the name of Castle. I like my name, but in the name of Castle, that's not going to push a prayer through. You know, I think Nicholas, it's kind of cliche, but Nicholas, I think that's a pretty good name. But cancer is not going to dry up at my name. It's not. But I believe the late Bishop Rance Allen said there's something about the name of Jesus. Do I still have any witnesses in here about that? That there's something about the name of Jesus that when you call on his name, I appreciate the name Aaron and Whitney and Chris. I appreciate you, but it's something that happens when we call that name. Thank you, Jesus. The, the Broken hearts have to become restored when you call that name. Minds have to be regulated when you call that name. Thank you, Jesus. Demons can flee at that name. Not my name. And I saw about to tell somebody, whatever you're facing in life, there is still a name that can keep you. Mm. There is a name that can sustain you even today. There is a name that can hold you no matter what it is you're going through today. There's a name that can fill you. There's a name that can save you. For the Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And if you're grateful for that name, can you stand up to your feet and real quick just offer up a praise for that name? Come on, lift up your voice and and just praise him for that name. The name that is truly above every name. 